everybody, this is Raul for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with bassist Hugh Richardson. Hugh Hello. is playing with Bat Out of Hell, the musical, and I always find it interesting to talk to our bass brothers and sisters that are hidden many times in the pit, uh, supporting <laughs> musicals, sometimes on stage. We'll find out more about that. But let's let's start getting to know you, Hugh. Tell us a bit about yourself and your bass journey. Well, um, I started playing bass uh, when I was a kid, so I was pretty young. I think I was about eight or so. Um, both my brothers played guitar at the time, um, and I took up bass. I, I've not, never really been sure why. It was just kind of it just seemed like a much more appealing instrument to me. Mm -hmm. um, so my brothers used to sort of teach me little simple things to play. Um, and eventually when I was about 11, I think my, my parents actually bought me a bass, you know, from there I sort of always just been very, very, very keen, very, very sort of, you know, wanting to practice a lot, wanting to play a lot. So I, you know, joined several bands when I was in school and then as a 16 year old, I started commuting to London each weekend to go and have lessons, which was really, really great. Got to study with some really, really fantastic tutors. And then from there, went to music school and, and got full time into, into playing and sort of working as a bass player, mm -hmm. really. It's been, um, you know, very sort of <laughs> filled with all, all sorts of experiences, as I'm sure you can imagine, but specifically sort of getting into theatre, which is where I do a lot of things now, obviously, with, with the show. Mm -hmm. um, it's been something that kind of, I never really sort of plan to go out and be like, you know, I really want to be the, the theatre guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was always, always able to read fairly well and sort of just kind of fell into it in a way, really. Gotcha. Um, and it's, it's been a great, great place to work ever since. Well, and the, the, the positions to play with musicals are few in between. And so... You, yes. what, what I have noticed in conversation with the musicians that play in the pit is that also you, you tend to build kind of a reputation of being trustworthy and able to read and able to, so one show can lead to another mm -hmm. show can lead to another show. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then it's, it's funny you say that. I mean, that's, if I think back to it, that's pretty much how I got my start doing theater stuff. Um, I had a, a friend and guitar player over here called John Gregson, um, who, funnily enough, is actually doing cover guitar mm -hmm. on the show. So he comes in and depth every once in a while. Um, he put me forward for like a one-off, I think it was like a charity theatre show. Um, and then from there, sort of met a few other people. And then about a year later, a connection from that phoned me to come and do a, like a fringe show. But then about... I don't know, four or five months after that, mm -hmm. BMD from that friend show called me back to do like a, you know, professional run of a show that ran for a month. And then it just sort of kept, you know, snowballing on and on and on from there. So I, I think it's exactly right. What you say, you kind of do get pigeonholed a little bit as the guy you could read. Sure. Well, and I, it was something that there was a uh, book that one of the New York City bassists wrote on how to be successful in New York City. And musical theater is a, a huge part of the music scene there. And so he was suggesting that, you know, you, you kind of needed to squeeze your way in by, even if possible, being able to sit in on short oh, yeah. notice or something like this, where, you know, you had to kind of prove yourself. And sometimes that could lead to you ending up being a more regular once you've kind of showed them that it's something that you could be proficient at. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, it, it's something I've always thought is maybe kind of not just true of theater, but of kind of gigs in general, you know, if you can be the guy who sort of turns up and sort of, you know, saves everybody's bacon, as we say, yeah. um, in Britain over here, you know, it's a massive kind of, you know, strike on your arm, sure. so to speak, to have this thing. But also, you know, it really kind of, I, I think it demonstrates you in a lot of ways as a, you know, very much a kind of an all-rounder as a player. You know, not only can you, you turn up and you play, but you can read pretty well. It also might mean that you're pretty good at kind of 
you know, sort of assessing situations that you're in and kind of trusting your ears a little bit if you can sort of go with this. It means that you're good at, you know, dealing with pressure. So, it, you know, with sitting in like that, I never think it's a case of just, oh, this guy can turn up and just read the dots. It's, it's so much more than that. So it, it really kind of puts you in a good, a good light, I think. Gotcha. And when it comes to musicals, it's 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 kind of interesting. My my wife has a, a background in in theater, so we've we've had many conversations about the direction that musical theater is going, and mm. we've seen I'd say a fair amount of shows that are music heavy or kind of rock inspired, if you will. And so right with this. Uh, the music, obviously based on music, Meatloaf's music, Bad Out yeah. of Hell, is is it something? Tell us a little bit about the show. Are do you end up on stage playing, or is it you're all the way in no, the pit? Or? we're down we're down in the pit uh, the whole time. Um, so it's, I mean, in, in a way, it's, it's kind of quite nice for us because we can really sort of just focus on playing, and you know, and anyone who's heard. Um, a lot of, you know, me love Jim Steinman's music. It's not sort of just your average sort of three minute pop songs. You know, these things go on for like 10, 12, 11 minutes, you know, sometimes. Um, you know, there's a lot of tempo changes. There's a lot of sometimes key changes. There are sort of time signatures in there that you, you know, when you listen through, you wouldn't expect them to, you know, to be there sort of mm-hmm. out of nowhere. You know, in a couple of the tunes, we have sort of bars of seven, eight jumping out, bars of five, four jumping out. And of course, we've got a synchronized with everything that's on stage um so for me i kind of always prefer you know we can just be down a bit we can just focus on that whereas i think if we're on stage i don't know if there would be an element of you know we've got obviously fitting with the set and with the action and all these sorts of things um but i mean the music itself is you know it's it's such a great play for the band um there was none we sort of talked about this when we were in rehearsals there's it doesn't really feel like there are any parts where they're just sort of there to just sort of be dead weight, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So like everyone has got a really, really great pad. Everyone's got a really, really great sort of role within the band. And, you know, the, the band is sounding fantastic so far. So we've been really, really lucky to sort of hit on a, a show that's, it is quite sort of musically heavy. We do get through a lot of songs, but mm-hmm. we're also getting through a lot of really, really great songs. Um, and we had, you know, an incredible time sort of just, I think we rehearsed for maybe 10 days, I think, before we moved to the theatre. Wow. Uh, roughly 10 days. Um, so we we got there, we did about a week or so with the band, then we moved in, uh, the cast came in and sort of ran through the songs. And then, you know, that we moved into the theatre, sound checks and everything. And then after that, we started uh, running the show. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the rehearsal period was sort of super, super intense, but um, I don't know, it just, it just felt amazing to be playing some of these really, really great songs and also to, you know, have the time to sort of really tooth comb through exactly what was, was wanted was, you know, amazing experience. You sort of learned a huge amount from it, I have to say. Gotcha. Well, and it's, it's billed as an epic tale of love, yes. rebellion, and rock and roll. So <laughs> how does, it, it, again, I, I always, because there's such a body of work from Meatloaf, the mm. labor of tying that together with a story and making it kind of coese versus being like like a concert where there's just a whole bunch of songs that you recognize. Right. How, did, how did they do that? Well, I mean, if if I'm completely honest, down in the pit, I can't actually see the stage. So, I, you know, the actual sort of staging of it, um, we're not, you know, I'm not really sure, yeah, I mean, um, sort of, you know, where characters are, how they move, all this sort of thing. I mean, I'm actually thinking I might, you know, dep out a night just so I can go and sit and, and watch it and see what it's like. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of story running through it. And um, there's also, I think, in quite a few interviews and everything, um, if you read with Jim Steinman, the guy who wrote all the songs, um, initially he was saying apparently he wanted to actually write Bad Out of Hell as a theatrical thing. Um, you know, so there's a you know there's sort of a story kind of kind of there mm-hmm. already a little bit. You know, so they, they've got characters. Um, there's sort of narrative that's sort of running through the song, so it isn't something like 
Um, it's not one of those things where they've had to kind of shoehorn a story in. Gotcha. If you know what I mean. You know, the actual songs can kind of move the plot along and develop the characters a bit as they go. It's not quite so stop and start in that sense. Nice. And gear. It's always because, again, it's another <laughs> thing that people would not see. What What are your tools of the trade? Well, this is so. This is an interesting one. I wasn't initially sure what to, to bring, mm-hmm. what to take along with this. Um, what I've ended up opting for is it's actually quite a simple setup. Um, I use a Sadowski five-string bass. Um, I've got going through there. A couple of sort of staples are down there. There's a, a volume pedal. There's a tuning pedal, obviously. Um, but I was, you know, wondering about do I take things like, you know, do I take a compressor? Do I take an EQ pedal? Do I take all of these sorts of things? Um, and I had them during the rehearsals. I had them with me, ready to use. But I decided against it for a couple of reasons. First of all. Um, Dynamically, there's actually a huge range um, that happens within this. So we've got obviously, if you listen to what tunes like, you know, Bad Out of Hell, there are softer bits and really, really loud bits. Mm-hmm. For one thing, but there are also quite a few bits of music in the show that are also a bit more kind of orchestral. Um, so when I'm having to blend with, well, we have a horn section, also guys that you know play flute, clarinet. You know, one of the keys players has got some really, really great string samples. It, to me, it didn't really make so much sense to sort of blend a compressed. I mean, electric bass is going to stick out there anyway sure. amongst those things. So, to can blend blend something that's a bit compressed with those didn't really make a huge amount of sense. So that was one thing. Um, but also, we were super lucky during the rehearsal. Uh, a guy called Steve Rinkoff. Uh, came along, um, he's a producer, and he actually bought the actual Bad Out of Hell sessions with him. So, okay. I mean, this, this was insane. If we ever, you know, we need to check a note in the pad, you know, it's not like, well, we had a an orchestrator we could ask, but we could actually go and listen to, you know, Meat Loaf's actual vocals or the actual bass track on the, the recording and just kind of go and check it. And the bass on there, it's, it's definitely very, very aggressive. It's played really, really hard, but it was clean. Yes. You know, there wasn't really an awful lot on there. Um, so to get the, the only other thing that was a bit tricky was because it's played so hard is to sort of get the punch and get the aggression. But at that point, it just seemed to make more sense. Well, why am I not just playing this a bit harder? Yeah. You know, it, it didn't really make a lot of sense to me to try and make that up with gear uh, with the compressor explicitly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so... Bass goes through volume pedal, tuning pedal, and then from there it goes into um, I have an A designs ready, um, which is a, I don't know if you guys know it. It's a kind of um, a tube, tube about the eye box, essentially. So it's quite big, sort of about this long, like that, quite heavy, mm-hmm. um, made by A designs, and it's it's been my absolute favorite <laughs> thing that I've ever bought. It, you know, it sounds you know unbelievably warm and unbelievably kind of fat, but without being uh, muddy in the low end. Nice. Um, so it, it's got a very focused sound, and it, strangely enough, it has a slightly kind of compressed quality to it. So any of the, if I am sort of lacking a bit of compression earlier on in the chain, I kind of make it up a little bit here mm-hmm. um, in the signal. So when that comes back to me, it, you know, it it sounds very, very sort of punchy, very, very tight without sort of being um, irritated me. So if that makes sense. Totally. And then, plus, you know, if there are so things like, you know, EQs and all the rest of it, the front of house guy um, has, you know, has done an incredible job. So I'm just sort of trusting him with that. And I've got pretty much everything set flat um, for me, just because when I had to listen through to the, the recordings, that's that's what I heard, really. Nice. Well, so and, it's, and if, you, if you think of it, it's, a lot of music and some of this stuff really transcends time. But when you look back, there wasn't as many effects or, or well, things yeah. available. And so it would be quite natural to, you know, kind of just play it the way. <laughs> well, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this is the, I always have a bit of, um, a bit of a kind of a saying uh, with what well, saying, um, a, a thought process, mm-hmm. I should say. 
when I approach any gigs, I, I always kind of liken it a little bit to, to going around to someone else's house for dinner in the, you know, I don't want to sort of make any assumptions about when I get there, oh, this is what that house's sense of humor will be like. This is what they talk like. Yeah. Um, the, the best thing is just to sort of turn up, you know, just sort of see the lay of the land, you know, try and work with what's in front of you and then go, and go from there. And it's, I think it's the same with gigs. Um, you know, I hadn't done a, a huge amount of research before I got this gig, but as soon as I sort of turned up, as soon as I had listened to some of these sessions, you do start to think, okay, well, how did they actually put this together? Um, and, you know, and so much of the music is so, you know, so famous and so iconic. You have to strike that balance of, okay, well, what are the things that I, I have to replicate? What are the things that I can't change? Sure. Um, and I'm already a little bit um, further out of that because I'm turning up with, you know, a modern active space, which they, they wouldn't have had mm -hmm. um, back in the day. So, but, you know, but the trouble is some of the newer stuff that's been written for the show really requires that I have it. A so, string. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, again, a lot of the orchestral stuff, you know, I'm down sort of, you know, low C, low D, like mm -hmm. you know, double basses would have the option of, extending down to exactly um so it's it's one of those things where i just did a bit of research and said okay well exactly as you said they didn't have a lot of stuff uh you know these sort of big thrashing rock tracks back then so it doesn't to me it didn't make sense that i had it either gotcha well and i think it's it's one of the reasons that some of the noticeable characteristics whether it be the wood that your bass is made out of whether you're playing with tubes or not, um, mm. you know, there, there's there's so many of those things that were sounds that came from the way things were, and it, it's always kind of funny because now with all the digital things, I was I was looking at uh, a head at the Nam show, and it's about this big, <laughs> and, it, and it weighs less than two pounds. Oh, and God. and it can duplicate you know tube sounds and all these things and so mm. the the engineers have worked to be able to duplicate natural sounds that just used to be the way they were you know and so it's it's kind of interesting yeah well I mean this is the thing that I mean there there's nothing wrong with gear like that I mean I. I always try and sort of be a bit pragmatic when I'm playing in that I never like to say, oh, I never use this or I always use that because, you know, situations can change. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the reality you have to, or I find I have to accept a lot of the time is that even the smallest thing will make me play differently. Sure. So whether or not I have an amp on next to me or I have it off, um, you know, I'm, I've been lucky to get a really great set of in-ears so it doesn't change the volume that I have but mm -hmm. you just it's whether or not you're actually moving any air exactly so it, it's things like that and likewise when it comes to you know do you get any kind of digital emulation things you go straight into a desk do you do compressors or, or whatever um, I think if this if you're not having to really sort of work to get the sound from your fingers it's, it's going to kind of I feel particularly it will make me a bit more of a, a complacent player, gotcha. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and also, so much of, I, mean, I, I found this sort of several years ago when I first started playing on, you know, shows with sort of bigger sound systems and everything, mm -hmm. is that you can't always trust your own perspective from, from what you hear. Um, so there's a one song in the show that's a kind of good example of this. It's a sort of big, sort of epic power ballad type of thing and the the opening verse is it's a pretty low dynamic so it's pretty soft um but the um some of the guys who were sitting out front came through to the pit and said oh you know it will sound really really great but this is in rehearsals it'll sound really really great if you can just dig in really hard in this and they said yeah, yeah it just needs the bass out front it just needs the kind of the weight and the energy and in my ears i'm thinking this just sounds bizarre you know i'm so Everyone else's dynamic is there, and I'm like, yeah, you're hitting, hitting it in. Um, but they recorded it, and I went and sat in the auditorium and listened back to the recording, and they were right. You know, it sounded, it sounded great. 
um, from there. So I think, you know, I'm, for those kind of reasons, I'm not too big of a fan of, you know, having too many things in a chain that will kind of take the work out for me because it's, I, I think it just makes me a bit more of a, a complacent player. Gotcha. Gotcha. And leaping away, as, as, as interesting as all this stuff is, and we could get, you know, certainly debate the merits of every piece of equipment ever made for me <laughs> because it, it, it is a part of the passion. And I think in the gear acquisition syndrome, it's that perennial search for that perfect sound in your voice. But moving away from the show, obviously you have other things going on. Tell us a little bit about what projects you've got going on, what, you know, what are you doing? Absolutely. Well, um, in, in addition to doing the show, I'm, I'm running a teaching website. It's sort of been a, something that I've been kind of developing on the side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I've, I've taught for maybe about eight years now, you know, really enjoyed it. Um, so it's the, the site is called onlinebasedguitar.com. So I'm housing at the moment there sort of free YouTube lessons a free sort of weekly vlog which kind of just follows me around nice. what I'm doing as well as sort of developing, you know, lessons and courses and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of in my focus quite a lot. But um, actually on days off from the show, sometimes I'm actually still hopping back to London to do, you know, um, a couple of recording sessions or to do a couple of gigs down there, mm -hmm. which will hopefully sort of, you know, break the show up a little bit. So it's sort of... Um, I guess it's just sort of trying to just sort of trying to maintain a certain level of you know working bass player sure. status sure. really. Um, so, I mean, I've got that on, I and mean, I have um, a couple of bands that we sort of played in just for fun. So um, there's a, a sort of a horn funk jazz group I, I work with um, called the Hornets. We uh, we haven't done anything for them in a while, obviously. Because I've been up here, mm -hmm. um, but it's that, you know that's a fantastic band. There's a lot of sort of old like you know Patrice Russian and things like that in there. So it's a real sort of um, much more of an improvised thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we're hopefully when I've got a bit more time, we're going to look at trying to you know get a few more things together, get a few more gigs going. Um, but that would be you know dependent on me being back in London. <laughs> sure. Well, and I find when people are are playing with shows. A, a lot of times, as as an outlet, it's the interesting phrase you use is for fun, because there is a little bit of repetition to playing the same score over, oh, sure. and over and over and over, and kind of the out your creative outlet, whether it be you know just you know playing something totally different or writing or teaching, uh, all of these things I think help keep you balanced and to a point sane. Where you're just not going, oh, not this again. I can't, I can't oh, do the course. same thing. Yeah, well, I, I think that in the repetition is not necessarily something that's you, you need just to see them. I mean, this is the the nature of gigs, you sure. know, period. If you, you know, if you take a pop tour for, you know, three months, six months, or you are on it for a year or however long, you're playing the same stuff. Yeah. Um. So, you know. You know, even right down to if you do, you know, wedding bands or, you know, jazz gigs, there's a list of sort of standards that come up a lot. Um, so what I always try and think is um, I try to make sure that somewhere else in my day or in my week I've done more music than just the show. So, you know, whether or not that's listening to something, whether or not that's, you know, um, practice, whether or not that's going back, you know, to London to, to do a, an, another gig or another recording or something there. Um, I think that's where I find that if I've done that and if I get down to get down to the pit and start playing, it actually feels a little bit fresh that way. Um, but also, I, I think I, I find it helps not to view things just on a sort of a show-to-show -show basis when you're on, you know, working with a longer form gig and then I think one of the things I learned when I was about sort of 23, 24 um, was that I had to take a, a kind of a different view of consistency as a player, um, not just in terms of, you know, okay, well, did I have a good 
you know, was this song particularly good or did I have a good first half? But, you know, how consistent was I across, you know, these two weeks or these, you know, two months or however like that. So I I do catch myself sometimes, you know, saying, oh, you know, I'm playing this again, but I think, well, you know, actually it's, it's the wrong way to look at it. Gotcha. Well, and one of the things I think maybe, and, and, and you can tell me if it's a challenge, is that with music, there is an interaction with your audience when you're on stage that you don't necessarily have from your tucked in position with, in the pit, you know? And yeah. I, I remember uh, back in, in, in my day when I was playing with this group, uh, there was one particular situation where I had a, a bit and it, 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 you know, it brought the crowd out of, ah! and I was just like, <laughs> Wow, this is one of the greatest things I could I could remember, but yeah. it's it's I think sometimes the audience because they don't see you, you're out of sight, you're out of mind, you you don't get that interaction back and forth. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you don't. It it is a little bit strange <laughs> at first, um, you know, to particularly when um, you know we're. You know, we're we're so far removed from the audience, and when a song finishes, all the the kind of relevant microphones and feeds from that will be cut in our ears. So we can play, you know, these really massive epic tunes, and we sort of play the hell out of them, and then there's just nothing when it finishes. <laughs> you know, it's just a bit um, a bit strange. But but I think there's a a couple of things to keep in mind, particularly with musicals, but also. Actually, not just for musicals, I'm going to change that, it, particularly as being a side man, mm-hmm. um, is that you're there to support something, you know, whether that's you're there to support a singer, whether, or in you know, my case at the moment, we're there to support a show. Um, we can't, I think it's a, a mistake to sort of turn up and think, even though it's a musical, even though these songs are a big attraction, to think that, you know, it's all about the band. Sure. Because it's not, you know, there are actors on stage, there's a cast, there are incredible singers, there's lighting, there's all these other things. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have to sort of really keep focused on on being a part of that. Gotcha. Um, but to, to be honest, I think the other thing that really, really helps, though, is that we've been so fortunate on this show to get great songs, but also get a great band. Um, you know, you can really sort of one of the things I'm enjoying, you know, because the rest of the guys are, are so, so good is I can actually, you know, focus a little bit more on what I'm hearing. I'm not having to worry, you know, so much about sort of playing safe in case anybody else goes off the rails. I know that they're going to be there. So mm-hmm. if I do have an idea and something changes a little bit, you know, you can go and explore it without it being a huge, a huge problem. And, and it, it really helps. Obviously, we can't go over the top. We can't sort of ruin it because, as I say, it's about the show. It's not about the band sort of chopping out for a couple of hours. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, the the thing is, I think with a show like this, and this seems to be the way that quite a few musicals are going, is they want to move away. We got told this again when they were in rehearsals. They didn't want it to sound like we were reading a note for note thing. You know, even though we've got you know, note for note transcriptions of these parts. Mm-hmm. The actual spirit and the way that a lot of this music was recorded is kind of, it's not, you know, particularly written down and planned. It's meant to be a bit sort of risky and... Spontaneous, yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, to be honest, as long as we're not, you know, changing anything iconic or as long as we're not ruining something, you know, changing a few things here and there actually makes it a better show mm-hmm. for us. Mm-hmm. And if there was a young basis, because I know a lot of people that, that see these, they, when they listen to somebody who's actually doing this and they go, wow, I think I'd like to do that. What, what would be the, the one gem of advice that you would give somebody if they were to try to pursue <laughs> this? Other than leave your show alone because you're enjoying playing where, where you are. Um, oh, that's tough. Okay, I mean, I oh, I can only pick one. Mm-hmm. Oh God. Okay. Um, 
Uh, okay, I need. Okay, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to pick at least two. Okay. I'm sorry. That's good. Okay, so um, the first one is, I think, has got to be, you know, make sure that you're you're always working on your way and make sure that you're always broadening your horizons a little bit. Um, you know, whether that's you know for the type of music you listen to, the type of things that you play, because you just don't know when these things will will come along and also how much time you're going to have. Sure. Um, sort of testament to that is before we started this show, um, I got called to do a week of sort of pro promo stuff for it, um, which was back in, I think, November time. And then we started this in January. Um, and that was very much, I got a phone call, like, oh, are you free in a couple of days? Sure. We went off to this film studio. No one had seen any of the music before. We got there. It was put on a bandstand. We rehearsed for about an hour, the cast joined us for an hour, and then the next day we're into shows. You know, and oh by the way, all of this is getting filmed for promo and recording stuff. So we didn't have a lot of time. Gotcha. So I you know, I think if I was sort of very glad at that point to have put in the work, you know, um obviously on, on reading, obviously on sort of knowing the instrument, but also just on having listened to a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there are things you can't read with your eyes you can you know read them with your ears a little bit and you're not having to to let the band down like that so i think that would be the first thing to get out i would say the second thing um a slightly strange one i mean i, I think one thing that's really helped me is i would say don't be tempted to try and sort of put all your you know your self worth out with your playing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, because no matter how, you know, no matter how hard you you practice, how hard you work, you know, sometimes things unfortunately just don't go your way. Sure. Um, and I think what what I've seen, you know, particularly when I taught with um, some students, and what I've you know sort of seen a lot myself when I was younger, is you kind of start to beat yourself up a bit when you shouldn't about, oh, you know, I can't believe I didn't get called for this and I'm so good, you know, why don't I get called for that? And it's often, it's nothing, to, you know, it's not that you've done anything wrong, it's not that you're a bad player, it's just, you know, if 10 people are up for the gig, only one can get it and that's that's the end of it. So sure. I've, I've certainly kind of been able to take a lot more satisfaction from my own playing sometimes where I know I can just turn up, play, You've done a great job, and you can kind of just leave that where it is. You know, if you get called again, fantastic. If not, you know, you don't want to be sort of sat at home, you know, beating yourself up a bit when you could be either, you know, practicing or out, you know, trying to find something else. Sure. Well, and I was told, I was in conversation with another bassist, and one of the key things that he mentioned that had been useful was the issue of being trustworthy that oh, sure. you, yeah. you, as you build your reputation, if, if there was a uh, hundred people that could play this part, but somebody else in the band knew you and they knew you were trustworthy and you, you, you were a, a very steady, stable individual that could be counted on, that that could mm. be just the tipping point right there that was enough well, to go, yeah, let's go with this yeah. one. Well, often it is. I mean, the, um, I think, you know, to build on exactly that point, um, you know, you hear a lot of musicians talk about networking. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an important thing, but I, I always find it a slightly funny term because if I think about all of the people that I enjoy working with, a lot of the time, you know, we do talk about gigs, but whenever we meet and talk, you know, it's always, oh, you know, did you see this football game or do you remember that time we went out to here it's sort of you know I never really think about it in terms of um, my business contacts it's sort of sure I, I would say you know don't network make friends totally you know um, absolutely you know and if you can come across you know sort of build this idea of you being trustworthy and everything it's, it's super super important but because music is such a social profession you know people have got to want to spend time with you 
um, you know, no one's going to go, you know, oh, there's this one guy we can't stand. You know, we've got a nine-month gig, but, you know, let's get him anyway. Yeah, he's very you know. talented. Let's bring him in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm you know, sure by month four he's going to be all right. Um, yeah. yeah, no, it, I, I think that's, like you say, you know, a hugely important thing is just, you know, being trustworthy, you're just being polite even. You know, it sounds like a real no-brainer just – getting on with people yeah um you know and, you know i'm sure there are loads of stories that every musician could tell about you know me people who haven't done that yes their down, yeah. their downfall well, well Absolutely. hugh i know you've got you've got a show pending actually this evening so we're kind of shorter on time um if people want to know more uh, about the show and be able to find out how and when they could see it where's where's the best place to look Best place is badoutofhellmusical.com. So this is the official website for the show. You can book tickets up there. Um, there's also sort of links to all their social media feeds. And, you know, they've been posting some really, really cool kind of behind-the-scenes pictures from rehearsals and from shows. So it's a really, really good place to go check it out. And that's where you can come see the show. Nice. And your own website again in case people want to look up some of those lessons? Absolutely. It's uh, onlinebassguitar.com. Perfect. Well, people, you've seen it. Thank you, Hugh, for giving us a, a, a portion of your time and this information. It's always great to talk to our working bass brothers and sisters. <laughs> and it's especially my pleasure. Those in the musical pits. I want to talk to more. So readers, look forward to us talking to more and more of the musicians that support uh, the rest of the arts. You've seen this interview here coming to you on Bass Musician Magazine.